Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. It's Wednesday, so it's, well, it's sort of a mail call video. It's not a normal one, so I'm not going to call it a midweek mini mail call. This is something that I did get in the mail, but it's something I ordered myself. And it's CRT based, and it's kind of cool. So, without further ado, let's get right to it. So a few weeks ago, I was browsing AliExpress, as one does, and I noticed something interesting that they had. What's this? It's a 12 volt, 4.2 watt, micro four inch CRT, black and white monitor, vintage CRT, screen electronic picture tube. And it really looks very similar to the Sony Watchmen's. And look at these here. It even says Sony right here. It's really hard to see, but it says Sony on the neck board. That one doesn't. And there it is actually showing some kind of video. And there's a wiring diagram. And there it is held in someone's hand. You know, this really looks like the small CRT that would be inside one of those old door cameras. I don't know. I, th I think I'm going to buy this. Fast forward a few weeks and a package arrived in the mail from AliExpress. And I think... This is the CRT that I ordered. Let's take a look. There it is, exactly as described. Definitely looks like it's new old stock. It has plastic over the front lens here. Oh, which is actually glass. Cool. There's the deflection yoke. We have the high voltage anode cap there and a little, I don't know, it's either a step up transformer or this is like a series of diodes that boost the signal or we flip it over, okay, there's a PCB here. Right here it says Tosho with the registered trademark, Viz 4001D version 1.0. There's a bunch of passives and we have some transistors, some diodes and things placed around this board. It's everything you need to make a CRT. This transistor right here is probably for the horizontal drive. It's got a heat sink that kind of comes up onto the side of this plastic case. We have an IC down there that's probably doing all the heavy lifting of you know everything that there is to do with a CRT. Lots of potentiometers here. That one's labeled V hold. This one says shift on it. Vertical size right there. And then this one here says key. So keystone, I have a feeling that means. And I think that has to do with the fact that you can see the phosphor coating on the CRT is actually hit at this angle here. So you probably need some kind of adjustment of the entire picture so you get some decent geometry on this thing. There are more pots here. This one is Focus. This one is H size. And then this one here is Sub Brightness. And there's a pot hiding down there that is Horizontal Hold. Now, if you think this type of a CRT is familiar, this flat CRT, it's because this was released in consumer products by Sony. And this right here is a Sony Watchman. And they were the originators of this idea where the CRT is mounted in the case this way and it shoots up and hits the phosphor at an angle like that. And when you are looking at the image on a CRT like this, you're actually looking through the electron beam. Just like in a normal CRT, the electron beam is generated right here. And it comes through the flexion yoke here, which has magnetic coils that move it back and forth. It does all the scanning. And normally in a regular CRT, it hits the back of the glass where the phosphor lights up and that phosphor lights up and you see it through the front of the glass. Well, in this case, that's the phosphor right there. And it actually goes like this and it hits the phosphor at an angle and then the light shoots up towards your eyes. So you are looking through the electron beam as it's passing through here and hitting onto the phosphor there. And I think four inch might have been the largest size ever made of this style of CRT. We have this little watchman here from Sony. This one is model FD10A and manufactured December 1991. And then I have another one here, which is actually larger. You can see it's its big brother. And what's cool is it's not physically that much larger than its small brother here, but yet has a much bigger CRT. This is model FD230. 
And on the bottom, manufactured January 1993. Unfortunately, on this one, I am not seeing anything that gives away the date of when this thing was manufactured. But I did see door phones in apartments and stuff like that that use modules like this pr probably, definitely all the way through the 90s, probably into the 2000s. Eventually, LCDs replaced uh, these types of displays because they were brighter, clearer, and of course, in color. But for a long time, LCDs were so poor performing, you really could get better image out of something like this. Now, I haven't answered the question of why I even bought this thing. I think it was because why not? It was only 20 bucks. It seemed like it would be a fun thing to play around with. These two Sony Watchmen do work, but neither of them have video input. They have RF only, and that's through an antenna. So they're not really usable. And I thought it would be fun to take something like this, which has video input, and see what it looks like hooked up to a retro computer. The ad said vintage, retro, whatever, whatever. Can this actually work as a little tiny CRT-based monochrome computer monitor? Let's find out. So the first thing I need to do is figure out how to get this hooked up to power, video input, and also the brightness and contrast controls. Now I've printed out the little schematic that was on the listing. Didn't even come with any paperwork whatsoever. So I'm glad at least this was available and I have saved a copy of this for future reference. So the little CRT has two connections. It has a six pin right here, and that's for a 50K potentiometer for brightness and a 1K potentiometer for contrast. And it's just the very standard six pin connectors. Now it says 300 millimeters right here. I wonder if this originally came with this kit and they didn't include it in the packaging. It would have been nice. And then down here is a four pin connector and it's got the video signal and two grounds. And then it has DC input, 12 volts to 15 volts. It's almost like this was designed to be compatible with a car because a car, you're going to see that voltage range uh, while it's operating. So we'll just give it 12 volts and hopefully that is sufficient. Here are the two connectors. There's the four pin and there's the six pin. And unfortunately, even looking through all my parts bin, I don't have this six pin connector. I do have the four pin version and I've already gone ahead and made up a little harness here. So we have the DC barrel jack there and we have the RCA jack for the video input and I know it's kind of silly how short this is and uh, I should have put a female connector on there but I actually don't have any female inline connector RCAs in fact you can see this is cut off an old cable here so I'll just have to couple this onto a longer cable I can just plug that right in there and at least now I can attempt to power this thing up before I go through the effort of trying to hook up the potentiometers to this other connector which I don't have so I have right here a 12 volt, four amp power supply. You can see I wrote on it with a, <laughs> one of my paint markers and it's a normal barrel jack. So theoretically I can connect this up and this little TV should start working. When I power this up, I should be able to hear the deflection happening on here. I don't expect to have any image whatsoever. So here we go. Is this gonna let out the magic smoke or is this gonna work? Well, I don't hear anything. Actually, when I pulled the power out, I did hear a little noise out of it. So I have a signal coming from my test pattern generator. Oh, and I can't just connect that. I need a coupler, which I have right here. So let's hook this up and see what we get. I can hear it running. I can now hear it actually running. Uh, when you hook up a video signal to a CRT, there's like a 60 hertz hum that happens. And there's also the 15 kilohertz frequency scan rate that's going on. I'm still not seeing any kind of image, but I'm not really surprised with the controls disconnected here. Let me pull the power out here. And it does stop. Incidentally, on the side of this high voltage device, whatever it is, we have a little bit of a model number here. All right, so for the brightness and the contrast controls right here, I don't have that six pin connector, so I'm gonna have to figure something out. Now, what I did find, I went into my parts, is I found two of these, I think these are 24 turn potentiometers or 25 turn potentiometers. And we have a 1K and we have a 50K part. Now looking at the wiring diagram, you have the resistor here and then you have the center wipe. And this is the variable part, this middle pin. So it's the second pin and the fifth pin. Well, luckily these devices have exactly the same pinout, so to speak. 
where the wipe is the center pin here, and then the two outside pins are the equivalent of the outside of the resistor there. So I think what I can do is just remove this connector entirely, and then hopefully I'll be able to solder these two parts directly onto the board. Now I have gone ahead and bent the pins because I noticed that the stock configuration, the pin spacing on here is not gonna be appropriate for these. So hopefully I can get it into the board with the pins bent this way. Incidentally, if you have some of these and you aren't sure of the value of them, what you can do is you can take your multimeter and you can measure the resistance between the two outside pins, and that's gonna tell you what value the potentiometer is. So these potentiometers can go from zero to whatever their rating is. So this is 1K, so zero to 1K or 1,000 ohms. So when you measure the outside two pins, it's just gonna say 1,000 ohms. And this one will say 50,000 ohms. That's just a quick way to quickly figure out what your potentiometers are. All right, so on the back of the board, there's this plastic sheet, which is held on by two screws on the sides here, but then a piece of tape at the top. It's nice to keep you from touching it and electrocuting yourself or shorting you know, out something by putting it down, but the tape is a little janky. So here is the connector. I'm just gonna grab the desoldering iron and remove this. Well, that was easy. Single-sided boards are almost a cinch. So this just comes right out. Come on. I know you want to. There we go. Whoops. There's that connector. I could always restore it back to the way it was at any time if I need to. All right, so looking at the diagram, the 50K is towards the top of the board. And this is the 50K here. I'm going to have to grab some tweezers to help insert these into the board. So the 50K and the 1K here. Of course, they're not sitting very well next to each other because I had to bend the pins over, but that's fine. You know, this should work. I just need to kind of position them. I'll do one at a time. So that at least they're right up against each other for a little extra strength. And maybe I'll just dab a little bit of hot glue in there once I'm done just to hold them in place. All right, these two potentiometers are installed and it doesn't look too janky. All right, here we go. Power up with the pots installed. Look at that. We have an image. Now I was completely anticipating since this came from China that this was gonna be tuned for 50 Hertz. So the H hold here should be able to be adjusted. Oh, it can't. Wait, oh no, there we go. There we go. I was gonna say it can't be adjusted. There was a little bit of uh, glue on there. There it is. Okay, let me turn off the lights so we can see this thing. Okay, so we have an image, but it's kind of blown out in the camera. So let me just spend a moment and adjust this thing here. Let's see what I can do here. I need some light to uh, see what I'm doing a little bit. All right, so I've spent some time fiddling with the CRT and I'm kind of shocked. It's not nearly as bad as I thought it was gonna be from a convergence, well, obviously it's not color, but a focus or a dynamic, whoa, look at that. How when I move my finger around, it makes the picture move. Wait, now, whoa. This has gotta be static uh, electricity, I guess, right? Because this plastic here, hmm. Let's see what else does that. Okay, so this is, uh, a screwdriver that's slightly magnetic and that has an effect on it. Anyhow, I'm gonna adjust some of the controls and I have a little bit of a flashlight here just so I can see what I'm doing because I have the, the lights turned all the way down. So this is the keystone one where it says key. And unfortunately it's not completely even. So if I get one side lined up like over here, then this side is slightly out of alignment, but it's, it's not terrible. This is the vertical size adjustment here. And it seems like when you shrink the picture, it sort of heads towards the top um, of the screen. There's a control called shift, which moves the whole picture up and down. And it does have quite an effect on the geometry of the set as you adjust it as well. Now I found right off the bat, now this is a matrix uh, image where there's a little bit of a color bar at the top here. And I found with the original settings, probably the way it was for PAL, 
it was shifted like way up there and then I had the vertical size so I could it was taking up the whole screen but that uh, color bar on the top was completely missing so I have to turn the shift all the way to one side uh, just to get it to kind of show the entire picture and then vertical size if I adjust it yeah I can make it look good about like that we're looking at the sharpness ramps here and it, this is the highest resolution section of the screen and it's actually pretty sharp it's not bad at all this is the vertical hold control which works as you would expect i'm going to adjust the focus potentiometer here that definitely works let's see if i can get this a little better i guess you really can't expect miracles considering the electron beam is at such a oblique angle to the phosphor. We have the horizontal size control, so we can make this quite narrow. What there is no potentiometer for adjustment is the phase, so you can't shift the picture over to the side. Every adjustment seems to have an effect on other things, like I'm stretching the picture here seems to get the keystone out of whack a little bit. Here we're looking at a grayscale ramp, and the brightness of this little CRT is pretty substantial. Now one of the faults, as you could see when I have the lights on, is the phosphor itself is quite a light color. So when light shines on it, it's pretty white, and that washes out the picture really dramatically. So I think the way this thing is set up is it really overdrives the CRT, so you can have an image that's somewhat visible when someone like walks up to your camera on the front door, I'm definitely going to go out and say that this thing has never been used. It's definitely new old stock here. And then the brightness and the contrast controls that I installed work properly. There's a lot of turns involved in adjusting them, and I had to turn the sub brightness down to kind of get things into spec. And there was glue on there, so someone had adjusted that at some point. But uh, yeah, these absolutely work. Obviously, we're getting a good image. So with this convergence pattern displayed here, I'm going to turn on the overhead light and we're going to see how washed out the picture actually becomes. Okay, so you know what? That's actually not too bad. I know in the camera it looks really, really washed out, but I think if we were actually displaying some text, well, I think it would be readable. <laughs> it wouldn't be great, but it would be definitely readable. Okay, so you know what it's time for? It's time for the peel. Let's get this plastic off of here. Oh yeah. Oh, it's very stuck on there. Just get it started all the way across. Okay, that's not satisfying. <laughs> but underneath there is absolutely the glass front of the CRT. So just like what you see when you're looking at the front of a regular computer monitor, that this is this is the glass here of this CRT. Isn't that cool? I mean, look how cool that is. The electron beam is coming this way and it's hitting that phosphor on the back of the CRT and we're seeing the light passing through the beam. Of course, the beam is invisible, but how cool. And all of that fits into this little flat CRT here. Now on the yoke right here, there are two rings and these are most likely centering rings. Remember how I mentioned that there was no way to control the phase of this picture? So if I shrink down the image here, notice how it's like moved over to one side. I think we can adjust these and then we can actually get this. Oh, there's quite a lot of glue on here. Let me try to break this glue. All right, I managed to loosen these up and these have dramatic effect on the picture. I'm pretty shocked actually. On a regular CRT, they do not move the image quite so much, but clearly the oblique angle that this thing is projecting causes uh, quite a bit of movement on this. So there are two rings and they can be moved separately and that moves the image around, up, down, left, right, and kind of diagonally and centered and kind of around. So I'm gonna get this as centered as I can like that. And now when I widen the image, okay, it's definitely a bit more in center. Let me adjust this keystone can control. Didn't really help there. Still a little out of whack, but not terribly. 
And there we go. I think it's probably about as good as it's going to get right now. There's definitely some distortion down there. All of these boxes should be exactly the same size. And you definitely see how they're not. Like down here, there's something going on in the corner. The keystone is not even between the left and right. There's definitely things are a little closer together in this part of the screen. It's just overall not great. But really, this was designed for use in a door phone. And they didn't really care. No one was going to be looking at the geometry of this CRT in that door phone application. Okay, time to test what everyone wants to see. Will this work with a retro computer? The flattest little CRT ever used on an Apple IIc, perhaps? I have the IIc ready to go. I'm going to place this on top of the computer, and I'm going to put a mouse pad on here. I just don't fully t t trust that sketchy piece of plastic there uh, to not burn a hole or something in the top of the computer. And I have a little power supply here, another one. I have run my Apple IIc off of a 12 volt power supply and I'm actually using the same power supply that I was powering the monitor from, this four amp one. That powers the IIc without issue. So I'm gonna use a, a one amp a power supply for the little TV here, a little monitor. Okay, that is connected and we have an image and here we go. Okay, so did you see that? That was the CRT being affected by the disk drive motor. How hilarious! I moved the monitor off to the side of the computer so that I wouldn't potentially mess up the disk I stuck in there with the magnetic field coming out of the CRT. And I've turned off the overhead light so we could see this a little bit better. And one of the issues about this particular analog driver board we see here is that it really, really amps up the brightness here. So this background, which should be black, is very gray. Now I'm going to turn the sub brightness control down so that goes away. All right, I think I lock the focus, so it should not be hunting anymore. So turning down the sub brightness, and I know you can't see what I'm pointing at, that had a dramatic effect. And you know what? This is... <laughs> it's actually, it's actually quite readable. That is insane. Oh, just touching the screen with my finger. Obviously, there's some static or something on my finger. The bottom syntax error is nice and crisp, and I'm pointing to it. And you can't see it, so I'm not going to point to it. The bottom syntax error down at the bottom where I'm typing the B, very sharp. But up at the top where I have that line of garbage and then syntax error, it's definitely losing focus. Now, let me try adjusting the focus control. Maybe I can split the difference. Get the top. Oh, you know what? That's better. Okay, the top's a little bit better now, and the bottom is even sharper. That is shocking. Okay, I'm going to run the diagnostics so that we can move the picture into an appropriate position here. Because I got to fiddle with the controls just for the Apple IIc specifically. Now, remember how I mentioned to shift the picture over to the side, I have to adjust those rings on the CRT. There's no control for that. But overall, I am totally shocked how clear this is. Let's boot the computer and go to 80 columns mode, PR number three. This is a test of 80 column mode on the Apple IIc. This is actually quite readable. I am completely amazed. I mean, no one ever would have thought that this thing, whoa, whoa, whoa. No one would have ever thought that this thing would actually be able to display text in a readable fashion. I am just amazed. Completely, completely amazed. There it is. Perfectly sharp image. <laughs> it looks really good. All those those vertical lines, they look amazing. I'm I'm really shocked. If you can tell by my voice, I am kind of blown away at this thing. It works so much better than I ever would have anticipated that this actually works. I didn't realize I wasn't fully zoomed up on the camera, so I zoomed in a little bit more. Look at that. Looks really really nice. Please enter your name. Adrian. I mean, look at the sharpness. Look at how sharp that is. 
Now what's interesting is you notice that this area, which should be black, sort of has a grayish tint to it. I can see that with my eyes as well. And I think that's not actually the, the electron beam lighting up that area of the phosphor. I think that's just like spillover from the light from this area, just making its way over to there. I'm gonna turn down the sub brightness control just to see if that has an effect. Yeah, it doesn't really, actually, you know what? No, maybe that is being lit up. Oh, it's really hard to tell, to be honest. If I exit out of the game here, we go back to just text here. When I turn the sub brightness up, that right now is the background being lit up by the electron beam. But if I turn this down just to where it's not anymore, like that, it really is nice and dark. Now, if we go to GR and we type text, we're going to get a full screen. And now, again, it looks like it's being lit up. I don't think it is. I really feel like that is probably just some kind of spillover. I'm not, I'm just not totally sure though. So I'm going to turn the light back on so we can see if it really washes out. And yeah, it really, really washes out. I unlocked the exposure on the camera. It looks not great in the camera, but it also looks not great to my eyes. It is really just the light lighting up the phosphor. It just has a very light coating to it. Don't know why that is. Why couldn't they have used something darker? Or maybe that's where, where how all CRTs look and the glass itself is tinted to darken it. I'm not sure if anyone knows about why this CRT has such light phosphor versus other black and white CRTs. I'd love to hear about that in the comment section. And now I just turned on my bench overhead light, which really, really washes out the, the picture because the light is coming down like this and over my head. You can just see the reflection of the light above my head. So yeah, not, not ideal in that regard. So I'm very curious what voltage this CRT runs at. And there's a little plastic trim piece here, which I'm gonna take off, which should allow me to stick my high voltage probe under the anode cap, maybe. It's a little tiny miniature anode cap. So it really uh, may, not, <laughs> may not allow that thing to go in there. Let's see, does this come off or is it glued on? What's happening here exactly? Okay, it was glued on. Oh, oh, that's not good. That was the ground. I gotta unplug the power. So this is the ground and it sticks onto the CRT there. There's a DAG ground and I didn't realize that that's actually what's holding that on. And I shouldn't have disconnected that while this was running. So right here is the little high voltage anode cap, little tiny thing there. I'm gonna get my probe and stick it under there. Now I'm trying to get a reading off the probe and I can't just because I have to have that wire attached there for the DAG. Oh, I just got a big shock. Yeah, ouch. Go. Oh. Yep, that's what happens. <laughs> I got a couple shocks there. That's what happens when the ground is not properly attached. Uh, let's get that off of there. <laughs> so I don't think this was actually making contact even uh, with that stuck on there. <laughs> All right, the final test of this little CRT is to see how much current it draws from 12 volts. So I have it hooked up here to my bench power supply. So I'm going to send it 12 volts. I do have a video signal connected from the test pattern generator. Let me power this on. There is the image. It came right up. Whoa, look at that distortion. And as you see here, we're getting 200 and 89 milliamps or so at 12 volts, which with a simple calculation should allow us to figure out the watts. 3.468 watts. The AliExpress listing said it was about four and a half watts. So pretty close. One final thought about this, the distortion that is in the bottom corner here, it seems to be worse than any of the other distortion on this, although this whole side is not great. I wonder if there's like some magnetism, something that's magnetized slightly and maybe putting a, a little magnet or some kind of a little strip on here could help correct some of these geometry issues. If I have the screwdriver this orientation, it shifts the picture down. And if I put it in this orientation, it shifts the picture up. Next, what I'd like to try is I'm gonna turn down the voltage. So we're down to 11.4. It's definitely having an effect. It's weird, each time I lower the voltage, it 
it sort of makes the picture roll. But it's still running at 10.4 volts. Struggling though, it's really struggling. What about if we turn it up? So 12 volts. Okay, anything over 12 volts doesn't seem to really have an effect anymore. So it's obviously happy running at 12 volts. And actually interesting is the current draw, even at 13 volts, is about the same. So that means this thing is dissipating the additional voltage as heat. But it seems like 12 volts is the perfect sweet spot for it. So there we go. That's this little $21 4 inch flat CRT all the way from AliExpress. I am very impressed with this thing. I don't think there's a real practical use for it, but it's still cool. Would I recommend people running out and buying these? Probably not. It's really nothing you can do with these things unless you can think of a cool project. Maybe integrate these into a retro computer case somehow and you could have an actual CRT and not just rely on a boring LCD panel. So it's more interesting than anything else, but really, really not practical. It was still fun to play around with though. And I think if anything, it just looks really cool, even when it's powered off. So if you enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. But if you didn't, you know what to do. Thanks to all my patrons. I really appreciate it. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen now. And if you want to become a patron yourself, you can do so. All you need to do is check the description below and there is a link. Put your comments down below if you so desire. And don't forget to check out my second channel. I post interesting videos there all the time. And that is going to be it. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.